Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Canto Conversations. My name is Teresa Wankin, and I'm your moderator this morning. The future we envision post-COVID is one where people and businesses are prepared and enabled through technology. Digital technologies will play a crucial role in all aspects of our lives and developing a robust ecosystem is critical to the resilience of all economies. Entrepreneurs are the backbone of any society for job creation and economic contribution. And those who can pivot their businesses and teams to adapt to digital technologies quickly will ultimately enjoy the benefits of a seamless transition. On the chat this morning, we have Mr. Kevin Rhodes. Karen is the owner and tech blogger behind the, behind the brand Drone Island and teaches Caribbean entrepreneurs and business owners how to build an online business. His focus and his passion is to ensure that Caribbean region has a space to learn about the tools, the platforms and software that can help entrepreneurs build and grow within the digital age. We have the right guy on the chat this morning. Karen, welcome to Canto Conversations. We are very, very excited to have you share with us this morning. Thank you for having me. So Karen, I want to dive right in. I want to start by asking you, who is Karen Rose? So I would say I am a motivated millennial that uh, using his, his knowledge and experience from my years of growing up in Canada um, to serve the Caribbean region. Carib the, anytime I came back to Trinidad, Trinidad has always felt like home. I've always felt like a visitor in Canada and I'm just happy to be of service and using my, my knowledge and my passions um, just to help the region grow. Excellent. So how long did you spend in Canada? I spent 28 years freezing my tail off. <laughs> <laughs> so you're happy to be in the sunshine. So, sure. yes. <laughs> so what does entrepreneurship mean to you? We hear, we've heard the word. I want you to give us your insight on entrepreneurship. Um, I think entrepreneurship is really just about um, finding yourself and taking something that you enjoy and turning it into how you serve the community. Um, it's more than just having a business. It's, it's a mindset and it's a belief that you are not going to be reliant on a system and you are the, the ultimate, uh, the creator of, of, what, of your own happiness and your own freedom. Um, and once you believe in that, you could literally take anything that, again, is a belief of yours or a passion of yours and turn it into something that is what you serve to the community. And if you do that well enough, you're going to be compensated for it. Oh, great. So can you teach me to be an entrepreneur? Is it something that you learn or is it you hear about the entrepreneurial spirit in someone? Can you teach people to be an entrepreneur? Yeah, for sure. I think... I think it starts with unlearning a lot of what we have already learned throughout all of the years of conditioning um, through whether it's biasness through families or what we've learned in schools. Um, anybody can be, can be taught how to, how to be an entrepreneur. And I think the, the difference now with um, all of this technology is now that we have access to all these tools and these different types of technology, um, it's made it more accessible and the barriers are a lot lower for sure. anybody to be an entrepreneur. So you can definitely be taught. Um, and we just have to go through that process of unlearning a lot of the stuff we have learned over the past. Okay. Okay. What about the Caribbean? What are you seeing with the, in the Caribbean with regards to, to small and medium sized businesses to entrepreneurship? So I think Caribbean people are, very much entrepreneurs. And I mean, entrepreneurs is ultimately a buzzword, but yeah. I see more entrepreneurs in the Caribbean than I do growing up in Canada. Like our system over there is, was always, and still is to this day, go to school, 
get a degree, get a job. At no point are you thinking about opening up a double stand or opening up a, or pick two mangoes and go sell mangoes on the side mm-hmm. of the road. That's all entrepreneurship, right? Oh. So we have so many people with that entrepreneurship spirit, that hustle mindset where when push comes to shove, you know that, you know what, hey, I, could, I can go and clean two yards or I can go pick some fruits or, or go and fish and just go on the side of the road and sell. Um, and it's something that we don't even think to do back in Canada. So we, 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 we really do have an entrepreneurship spirit. Um, and you see it every single day with how we live. Great. Okay. So can you, can you go into some of the challenges for yourself first and what you see other entrepreneurs like yourself facing in the region? The, by far the biggest problem that we have is the, is the lack of information and knowledge transfer about all of our systems. Um, one of the, this is, this is something that I'm constantly being asked about, you know, how do I get my information? Where do I get my information from? And I'm so blessed that because I was born here, but I left Trinidad when I was two weeks old. So I spent 28 years in, in Canada. Canada is really what I know. When I moved here, I had to kind of reverse engineer what I would do in Canada and see what is the equivalent here locally. And then what I was able to do is because I kind of know, okay, if I'm going to start an online business, I'll need a website. If I'm going to have a website, I need a payment processor. Then I'll need logistics. You know, this is what I would use in Canada. You know, how do, who do I need to, to, to talk to here to get that information? Because when I go into the banks, when I go into the institutions, everybody you talk to, nobody knows what you're talking about. So the, the, the knowledge transfer in many of our critical organizations, especially the banks, is, is, is not quite happening. And it kind of just throws a wedge into everybody's plans. When you walk into a branch or you walk into an organization, you ask for some basic information, they can't give it to you. So for me, in knowing what I, in knowing what I needed, what has tremendously helped me was leveraging the power of LinkedIn. LinkedIn now is where, you know, all of the executives, everybody in the workforce for the majority, the majority of the people are on that platform. So I started to do my homework on, you know, who is who I'd go on LinkedIn, find out, okay, if I need to speak about e-commerce or I need to speak about something in marketing, who is running the marketing departments in these organizations? And then I would connect with them and I would ask my million questions. And then what I would do is because I've created my own platform. So I created my, my Droid Island website where I talk about smartphone tech. I created KarenRose.com to talk about entrepreneurship and digital entrepreneurship e-commerce. I would take those platforms and everything I learned and I would implement and I would see exactly how it works. I would then go on those platforms and talk about it. And then because, so for me, how my platforms became popular is when you're Googling basic questions, my website keeps popping up and you're not Mm -hmm. even getting the information from the institutions. So Mm -hmm. the the lack of information that's out in the public space is crippling everybody. It is hurting everybody. We want to do more. We want to do better. But Again, if I can't get the right information about the tools and the processes, it just frustrates everybody. And ultimately everybody goes back to the nine to five. And then we we complain when there's there's a lack of jobs because we have a lack of entrepreneurs creating jobs for people. Great, I hear you. And it's it's a complaint that has come from different aspects of the industry as well, where we need to have that collaborative tool with what's going on in the region um, in a seamless way. So anyone, regional citizens, as well as investors coming in, should be able to go in one place and see what's happening in the region on a nation to nation basis. Um, Technology, I want you to talk about technology. So you said that you went, um, or you used LinkedIn as your first tool of choice. So you created your own network and your own platform. How was that and how, what technology have you used and how has that been? 
So in building my own platforms, my own platforms be my websites. Um, so if anyone's wondering um, what is one of the easiest ways to build a website and cost-effective ways, uh, I use WordPress. So what I would have done is I have my, my blog and my services and everything on those platforms, and I'm constantly creating um, content that educates on different topics in my space. What I used LinkedIn for and, what, and how LinkedIn was so instrumental for me to get to this point is LinkedIn is, is the collection of pretty much all the business professionals in all the different spaces throughout the Caribbean, throughout the world. Um, everybody's on that platform. So I don't know what the CEO of, of B-Mobile or Digicel or, or, or the, any of the banks, I don't, I don't have them on Facebook. I don't know if they have Facebook. I don't know if they have Instagram. I'm pretty sure they probably don't. But everybody is on LinkedIn. So we have never been in a time period where you have access to all of the decision makers in one place. Everybody is literally one search away and one message away from you speaking to somebody in a position of power to get information from. So rather than, you know, I could have, I could have gone the route of, I came here and I'm trying to find information out and I'm not, I'm getting the runaround or I'm not getting the information. I could do, you know, what, what, uh, what most people do and jump on Facebook and rant and hopefully hope that somebody responds to my, to my rant to my, or my tangent. But what I did was I just jumped on LinkedIn, searched for the people in the organizations that I need the information from and messaged them directly and said, hey, I have this problem. I'm trying to figure this out. And I've either gotten the information directly from them or there's times where I've brought information to them and they, they, they themselves did not know that this was an issue. And the fact that somebody spoke to them, um, the fact that somebody brought it to their attention at that level, they were able to solve a lot of these issues. So if they can't give me the information, they will always put me in contact with the people I need to speak to, to be able to get the information that I need. You know, even on this call, the people I've met on this call, I've met through LinkedIn. So being able to network on that, on that platform um, is something that everybody should learn how to do because everybody is there and whatever problems you have, you can find the right people. You no longer have to, you know, again, go on a Facebook, make a rant about it because you could just go and talk to the people directly and get your issue solved. Okay. So, so Karen, what is a digital entrepreneur? A digital entrepreneur is somebody whose business is probably all online. They might not have a physical footprint. So for me, um, I used to have a brick and mortar store selling smartphones back in 2017. I had it for almost seven months before I closed it down because at that point in time, what I was doing was because I was blogging even before I had the physical store, um, I started to work with companies that wanted to work with me for my content, my intellectual property. When the paychecks from my intellectual property started to come in, it made selling physical products, it, it no longer made sense anymore. I was making a whole lot more money doing content and monetizing my intellectual property than buying and selling and doing retail arbitrage. So I decided to close down the, the physical store and I learned how to convert my blog into an e-commerce platform. So once I did that, rather than you know, purchasing products and keeping a physical stock, I started to use a popular fulfillment method called drop shipping, where I don't actually keep any stock of any product. And because my clients now purchase all of the products online, I will then bring the products in from my supplier and it gets delivered directly to my, my consumers. So my business is 100% online. I have no physical footprint. You actually cannot meet me in person or give me cash. Just mm -hmm. like how when you're shopping on Amazon, you don't meet Jeff Bezos to give, mm -hmm. him, any, to give him any money. You don't meet him at the corner of the road. So everything now is, can be digitized 
Um, and yeah, you're pretty much all online. So I would consider that a digital entrepreneur, somebody who is 100% online. Excellent. I, I want to um, talk a little about cashless payments, seeing how you brought it up. Can you tell me how easy it was for you? And what, uh, there are some in Trinidad, what are the ones, can you talk a little bit about it, the advice to give um, young entrepreneurs? What to look right. for in a mobile wallet? Right. So we are, we, timing is a heck of a thing because like, so my main payment process that I use on my website is WePay and WePay just launched in 2016, right? So prior to 2016, I have no idea how you would have done it, but uh, thank God for, for, for 2016 because a lot of things have changed since then. So there's a couple of ways I get paid um, through digital means. So one is if you have a website, you can set up an e-commerce website and you can have your clients purchase your products directly from your website. And we have, we have a couple payment processors that you can use. So you could use WePay to process your payments, right? You could also sign up with any of your banks um, to get a merchant ID and a, or a merchant account. And that would allow you to do e-commerce with the payment processor called First Atlantic Commerce. Um, they're a pretty popular one across the region. So they connect with your bank and you would be able to install that on your website to be able to process the payments. You can also use PayPal in the region, but here's the thing. I'll quickly touch on this because I want to stick on this point, but with PayPal, if I'm in Trinidad and I'm using PayPal, I could only deposit the funds to a visa enabled account. So I can only use a, either a visa credit card but if, you use, if you're depositing those funds to a credit card, there's higher fees. Or you could use a JMMB or a Venture Credit Union Visa debit card and PayPal connects to them and you can deposit those funds. Now, one of the reasons why it's we, we try to stay away from PayPal from a local perspective is everybody would see that the banks are now switching over to the new Lynx Visa debit cards, right? And the Lynx Visa debit cards are crucial for e-commerce. It is the most important missing aspect of e-commerce is having a mechanism for people to pay you online. If you are somebody who is using PayPal because links has blocked the banks or central bank for them has, uh, ha has blocked the local visa debit cards from access to Forex, you cannot use an international processor like PayPal to make a payment. So, what you would need is you would need to use a local payment processor. So if you have a website or you want to be able to send digital invoices because you're a service provider to people and you want people to pay you and they could use their bank card, you would use something like a WePay or a First Atlantic Commerce and then people that have the brand new Lynx Visa debit cards can pay you. Um, so that's one of the key benefits over using PayPal. Another way I get paid is I use a service called Paywise. Now, what Paywise does is essentially they've set up a network of dealers around the country and people can go with cash. So this is great for people who don't have a bank account, but you want to get paid. Um, your customers can go to a Paywise dealer. They can give them cash and then Paywise would then deposit the money into your bank account. So those are like the key ways that uh, from a digital perspective, you can get paid. And then there's also online bank transfers if you have online banking. Okay, so I want to take some questions from the chat right now, um, and I have a question from Stephen Cummings, right? Hi, Stephen. Um, do you have a view on Trinidad and Tobago? Are we ready to leverage online businesses? Yeah, we Can are you behind. Can speak to the region as well? Yeah, we, we, we are behind. And the reason we are behind is because there has been a lack of information in the public space. But when you look at a company like First Atlantic Commerce, they've been around for over 10 years. So that means e-commerce was accessible for at least 10 years within the Caribbean. Yeah. But because of so much misinformation on the company and a lack of information on you know, how to build websites or build any platform for yourself, 
you it's easily it's easy to become disenfranchised with actually going forward with the project if you're not even getting the correct information you could look yes. at something like uh jmb jmb has been in the region for i believe 10 years as well jmb has been the only bank to to be able to connect with paypal so once again you were able to do e-commerce for at least 10 years within the region easily but with for for, for with the lack of knowledge it just made the process what seems to be almost impossible. Okay. Um, I have another question from Stephen Cummings. What are the online software resources that can be used to improve your online business? So that is a very broad question because there are thousands of applications you can use. So what I will do just to not give you a vague answer is I will tell you about some of the, pl some of the tools that I use within my business, right? That handle key things for me. So one, for my website, I use WordPress. The processor that I use to process payments online, whether it's cash or through vouchers, is WePay. Um, I also use a scheduling tool. So because I also consult, if people want to book me, they can go on my website and I use a tool called Acuity Scheduler. And Acuity Scheduler integrates with my calendar and it sees exactly what my availability is and then it allows, it'll give you what available time slots you can book with me. So QD scheduler is one for invoicing. So I see a lot of businesses locally still use a receipt book. You could use a platform like wave wave is a free online invoicing invoicing and, and, and CRM that holds all of your customer information. So you can digitize all of your invoices and it keeps a database of all of your clients, all the products they brought, everything. You could do quotes, you could do invoices right from that free platform. So I do my invoicing on that um, as well. And another one I'll give you is um, I use HubSpot. HubSpot handles all of my email marketing. It handles all of my analytics from my social media platforms and it handles um, analytics from my websites and puts it all into, into one place so I can manage my relationships with all of my customers and people that are viewing my content. So those are some of the, the, the softwares that I use. Okay, great. So another question from the chat, what do you think would be the driving factor for other banks to come on board with e-commerce integration? That's a beautiful question. <laughs> And you are looking, now this is, this is going to sound bad to say, but this is a silver lining. The best thing that happened to the Caribbean was COVID-19. <laughs> yes. <laughs> COVID-19 has fast-tracked what would have taken 10 years again. Because the, the banks, the institutions were simply dragging their feet on on pushing for e-commerce and pushing to educate the space. Um, COVID-19 has fast-tracked that. And the th at the end of the day is we're not out of the woods. Somebody can come aboard and sneeze and six people get infected, 10 people get infected. There's no, there's no cure right now. So we have to operate like COVID-19 can lock down Trinidad and the rest of the Caribbean tomorrow. So now everybody is fast tracking the plans as to how they can get their businesses online. So COVID-19 is your answer. So we call COVID-19 the acceler the digitalization accelerator. <laughs> yes. And then I have another question that follows nicely from this one. If you could control entrepreneurship in the region, what would be your first action? If I could control entrepreneurship in the region, yes. what would be my first action? Yes. My first action would be to create a safe space for people to learn about the, the various aspects of entrepreneurship, right? So we are not taught entrepreneurship in the school and we sure as heck are not taught about digital entrepreneurship and the tools and the processes that you need to build a business online. I would create an organization that looks at everything from, you know, doing your taxes online, doing invoices, how to do YouTube, how to do e-commerce, how to build your own website, how to build apps, how to, I would have an institution that focus on all of these different courses. Like, so everything that I just touched on would be a course. So you would have a course on YouTube 
because YouTube can generate Forex and can generate other opportunities for you. And even if you're not directly monetizing off of it, it's the second largest search engine. So you're still going to get yes. brand visibility. So I would have an institution that teach, that taught all of those different aspects. Okay, great. So we have a comment and a question, and I have to read this comment. You all have to forgive me. It's from Phyllis, and she's saying, as a fellow Canadian, Jamaican, I applaud your courage to step into your dreams in your country of birth. How do you suggest folks get their website online, their website or their online store known to potential customers? You would start to learn about digital marketing, specifically digital marketing. You want to learn about SEO, search engine optimization, and those tools, because those tools allow you to figure out, um, like, we have SEO tools that allow me to see exactly what people are searching for online in depth. And when I know what people are searching for online, I can now create the right product and service sure. to cater to those people's needs. And then I would also look at social media marketing. Now, Caribbean wide, we only ever focus on social media marketing, but social media marketing should be used as the breadcrumbs to come back to your website, right? I'll say it again. Social media <laughs> should be used like as that. the breadcrumbs to come back to your website because when people are coming to your platforms, people think a website is just to show your product and service. No, your website, when set up correctly, is the most powerful tool in your arsenal because there is so much data. If I were to show people the back end of my website and all of the data that my website collects and then I know the tools to access Google's data, you would be scared as to how much data is there. However, on social media, you know, you, you know next to nothing. You don't know anything on social media data. You know very little. The real power of, of the online space is not on social media. Social media is amazing to showcase who you are and to engage, but ultimately you wanna be using it to bring people back to your platforms. So digital marketing, SEO, and learn how to use social media marketing. That's how you'll get people coming back to your website. Great advice. Um, I have a question from Flavia. Hi, Flavia. Flavia is asking if PayWise is a government or private initiative. Also, what is the cost for users who do not use a bank account? I guess what she's yeah. trying to get on, how easy it is for the unbanked to use pay, why? pay why? Yeah, So, so um, no, they're not a government initiative. I don't know about any government initiative with respect to payments. Um, so they're not a government initiative. They are a private company. The users, the users, when they're getting, the users don't pay anything. The users, so if I do not have a bank account, but I want to pay you, Flavia, for your service. If your service is $200, the cost to me, the, the consumer, is 200. However, you as the business owner, they charge at like $8 for anything under, I think it's like three or $4,000. And then if it's over that, they charge another $8. So your fee is like up to like 16 TT. Um, it's, it's really good. It's very much worth the service. Um, one thing you just have to be careful about is they used to be in NLCB boots and that was perfect because it was everywhere. Now, when you look at PayWise, you just need to ensure that you don't have a ton of your competitors as one of their agents. That's just one of the asterisks I put out there when, when you're using PayWise. Okay, great. Um, I have a question from Joe, but Joe is referring to the business accelerators, to the SOEs and stuff like that. So I can scroll down. SEOs are free. Can they alone do the job or do you have to invest to get the right kinds of analytics? Um, so most of, most of the tools that you have are free and then they have a paid version. So I guess she wants some clarity on where do you find that medium? Yeah, so I look at it like this, right? When I'm paying for a tool, how how much stress does that tool relieve 
from me? And is it worth it? So for example, the invoicing platform I use is free. Um, I push more people to my website to pay. So I wouldn't pay, I wouldn't pay for an invoicing tool because the invoicing tool for me is mainly used for my offline customers, people who don't have a credit card and I have to send an invoice to. So I wouldn't pay for an invoicing tool because most of my customers come in through my online place. However, Acuity Scheduler, I'll break that down for you. Acuity Scheduler does multiple things for me. So before I started to, to I guess before I started to get a, 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 a load of customers, it was easy for me to look at my calendar. So somebody says, hey, Karen, I want to work with you. Cool, no problem. I look at my calendar. I go back and forth to see when I'm free, when they're free. We settle on a time, right? Next step would be I have to now go on the computer or go into my phone, jump into Zoom, create a meeting, and then I have to now send that person a request. I would then use a third tool, whether it's Google Forms or Type Forms, but I would have to send a third, uh, I would use a third tool to now do a customer intake form and send that customer intake form for that person. So you see, like if you have, if you're not, if you have no clients, you know, the one or two that you get, well, you have the time to do all of that. But the minute clients start to come in, you don't have that time and you do forget. So there were times where I might have forgotten to send the intake form or to send a Zoom link and it's just pressure. So I pay for Acuity Scheduler because Acuity Scheduler gives you, it embeds onto my website, it integrates with my Google Calendar. So anytime I put in anything in my Google Calendar, it removes those available slots then people can book at their own leisure. So the only thing I have to do is my schedule is already configured. So whatever is available, you pick from that. They would pick the time slot they want to book. They book me. Then it integrates with Zoom. So it automatically creates a Zoom link that they automatically get sent in their booked um, spot. And then because they have their own intake forms built in, I just created an intake form inside of Acuity and it sends them the, um, the, the intake form as well. So I pay for a tool like that because it does and takes away so much stress and allows me to be more efficient in my business. Okay. So the audience is getting a very, very, very good session this morning. And <laughs> yes, I am. I myself am learning. A whole lot. So we have a question from Sherwin. What are your views on a fully integrated solution like Odoo versus using and managing several platforms? Um, I haven't used Odoo and, and nor have I looked into it, so I wouldn't be able to give an you a, an answer on that one, unfortunately. Okay, so I guess this morning, all of these oh software platforms are getting free advertisements on the Canto channel this morning. <laughs> um, but it's good because um, it's something, the idea is to create one place where all entrepreneurs can go to learn from people that did it already. And that's one of the objectives of Canto and this platform. So we're happy to have you here. Um, Karen, I want you to give us some lessons learned along the way as you started on your own and you have been making several great inroads. What are some of the lessons that you've learned along the way? Um, one of the, the most important lessons for me is, you know, don't focus on the money. Focus on something you like to do. Um, people look at me I show a lot of the behind the scenes. I talk a lot about the things I do, how I do it, when I'm doing it, you know, things I've learned, whether again, it was a success or failure. I talk about it on all of my platforms. And the one thing that comes up, the one question that, that, uh, that comes to me all the time is, you know, like, do you rest? You're always working. And I love what I do so much. It never feels like work. And it's because of the fact that I love what I do Work doesn't only not feel like work, but in the times when I might be tired or I might, you know, run into a roadblock and I'm like, you know what, when I could say, you know, forget this, I'm, 
let me just scrap it and do something else. It's because I love what I do so much that I'm always looking for solutions to solve this problem, right? So figure out what you're passionate about and the digital age has allowed for you to take a passion and turn it into a business. And I'll give you two examples that I like to tell everybody. There's a platform called Teachable and Teachable is a learning management system where people can go online, take their knowledge and build courses. And you could sell it all over the world and have people come in, right? In 2019, Teachable's two highest six-figure US generating courses that were weird were, the key word is weird. So they did a summit and they're like, these two courses stood out as like, you wouldn't even think of, of somebody doing a course on this and then it generating over six figures in US. Those two courses were one, how to find a copper deficiency in goats. And the second one was advanced blacksmithing. And on the summit, everybody had a, like, everybody had like a wow moment because it's so true that you can take any skill, any form of knowledge, any passion and turn it into a business. And because of the technology, even if nobody in your country cares about blacksmithing because we're not riding around on horses with swords and shields, there is somebody in another country that does. And you can now communicate with those people in other countries. You can sell a product, a digital product to people and you can also receive that money and put it into your local bank account. Okay, great. Um, how can we encourage an entrepreneurship culture within large organizations? With, with large organizations, we need to let people get some room to be able to be creative. Um, a lot of the times, you know, companies are set up with a lot of red tape and it's, this is the policy, do it exactly like this. So it doesn't really give you the space to be creative. And most companies are run by, they, or they have, they have um, people in decision, the people in, in positions of power who aren't open-minded that don't even allow you to exercise your creativity. They just shut it down and want you to stick to the script. So organizations need to start being a lot more open-minded. Organizations also need to start investing or making available courses so that people can upskill. Um, when I consult with organizations on e-commerce and just building their online presence, I'm always amazed that the, the IT people they bring into the room to, to be present when we're having a conversation have no idea what I'm talking about. But these are the experts they are bringing into the room to ensure that, you know, I as the consultant are, 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 have their best interests in mind. And they aren't even skilled to have that conversation. They went to school five, 10, 20 years ago and did IT to learn how to fix computers and printers and networking problems, but have no idea about e-commerce, digital marketing, SEO. So organizations need to start looking at what skills are they lacking for the digital space and whether you can, you know, pay for courses to have your employees upskill so that again, they can help your business grow. But, you need to be open-minded. You need to be thinking about what you guys are lacking and you need to be willing to invest in your people. So Karen, I'm laughing because I'm one of those people who went and did IT. Well, I'm more, uh, much more than 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> so I would not comment on that, but um, the skill set is changing rapidly. And um, but to your point, to, to add to that point, right? Like every day I wake up, the most popular platforms to market, Facebook and Google, are changing tools. They're changing the way they do things every single day. So why does an organization think that what that person in your marketing department did a year ago <laughs> is still relevant and you're not investing in the courses to keep them up to date today is, is 
just mind boggling. And then we wonder why we're still so far behind the curve. <laughs> yes. And it's, it's, it's so correct because young people, we say young people rule the world um, because they don't wait for formal education to do anything. Um, you learn when, while you make mistakes and then you better those mistakes and you carry on. We have a question from Facebook. What are some mm -hmm. of the policies that governments should put in place to facilitate digital entrepreneurship apart from addressing the skills gap? What are your thoughts on incentives such as giving entrepreneurs access to low interest credit? Um, so I try to stay away from the, from the policy side of things. I leave that to the policy experts. My thing is always, you know, looking at the tools that are available to me and teaching people how to use those tools to better their business. So I really, I really do stay away from, from the policy side of things. Um, in terms of incentivizing, giving incentives to entrepreneurs to access low interest credit, um, it needs to happen. Like um, our banking systems are not set up to help this new age entrepreneurs. Um, when there, there, there is a credit union that is working on that, where they are literally telling you, hey, if you are a digital entrepreneur and you need to get equipment like a camera, a computer, they have adjust what their their criteria is to facilitate how you earn your money because when i go into a bank excuse me when i go into a bank and i'm opening an account and they ask me well you know what do you do i'm self employed okay what is your business i am an online business educator and i run an e-commerce store they look at me sideways <laughs> and then the question is well how do you make money well, I just list products on my Droid Island website. People buy it and I make money. Okay, but how do you make money? Well, I mark up the product and I make the margin. And it, they can't understand because when we get to the part about my expenses, my expenses for the business are next to nothing. My internet bill, my $5 hosting fee, they can't understand how you are earning so much money and you have next to no expenses for the business. So we need to have, um, whether it's the government, whether it's the banks, the, we, we, we need to start catering to this new age of entrepreneurs. We, the millennials, don't have the assets um, to, 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 to lean on to get some of these loans that people are asking for. We can't give you a collateral as land. We can't give you a car. We, we, we don't have the assets. So at the end of the day, we are the ones that are coming in. We have the buying power now, but we don't have the assets for the, for the criteria that you guys want. So those things definitely have to change, but I'm encouraged because I already know of a credit union who is working on those changes as we speak. Very good. And tell me about youths. I want to see, give me your ideas for getting more youths involved in entrepreneurship digital entrepreneurship. Yeah. We have so much talent in the region and the youths need to harness that talent. It's a passion of mine to see people harness their talent, commercialize it, package it for sale anywhere in the world. It, it starts at home and it starts with parents being able to say, you know what? I have no idea what is TikTok. <laughs> I have no idea what is Twitch. I have no idea what you would do on YouTube, but giving them the support to try out new things in this space, because it's not going to make sense. My daughter, my daughter is, is, is 12 with an iPhone 11. And when she was getting her phone, and she was asking me, hey, dad, you know, what phone should I get? I'm, I'm, I like the iPhone 11 or should I get this? I'm like, you know what? Get the iPhone 11 because it has like the best video quality. So when you're taking out your TikTok videos, you're going to get the cleanest quality possible. We have to start encouraging them to use the tools because ultimately all of these platforms can turn into monetization, whether it's directly on the platforms, even if my daughter 
doesn't make a penny from TikTok, she could have generated a scholarship to her dance school because she loves to dance because maybe she did a viral video or maybe uh, the, the dance instructors who are looking for students, they're on TikTok and they're looking to see who could be potential students to come into their dance school. The entire world has changed with how people are scouting for their next talent. And if I was the parent or, or if her mother was the parent to say, you know what? No, we, all you're doing is making, you know, foolish dance videos on TikTok or you're making foolish dance videos on YouTube, you know, cut it out and go pick up a book. She would be losing out on opportunities in this generation right now, right? For me, my mom, when I, when I, when I moved here, my mom was like, oh Lord, I moved from Trinidad to give you a better life. You moved back to Trinidad for, for a better life. What's going on? <laughs> and then she can't understand. She's like, people, she's like, you mean to tell me people are paying you to teach about smartphones? Like, this is a thing? And I'm yeah. like, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, none, yeah. of, none of what I do makes sense to my mother, but it's at the point now where all she keeps seeing is, you know, the, the, the successes are getting are piled up. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, you know, clearly you're doing something right in a generation that I don't understand, and that's okay. I support you. Great. Yes, and I, I identify with that because as parents, we tell our kids, listen, you have too much time. You're spending too much time on your phone. Um, there should be a certain age when you would get a phone. You, you don't need a phone with a, a camera. You don't need a phone with internet access and stuff. But I, I like the fact that you encourage your daughter to use the phone and use it properly. Because and, they will you learn to use it regardless if we yes. identify with them or not. But you, make a, you make a point that I want to I wanna touch on quickly. Having a phone with internet access Growing up, we had encyclopedias. Now we're not touching encyclopedias. And the encyclopedia is our phone, right? What I would encourage parents to do as well is there are e-learning is a multi-billion dollar industry right now. Everybody is teaching online. There are so many platforms that are teaching digital skills today. I recently registered on a platform called Skillshare.com. Skillshare right now, because of COVID, is giving you two free months access to all of their course content, and then it's $15 a month after that. And on that, you're learning things like business admin. You're learning things like videography, photography, how to edit, and all of these are high-income skills. When I build a website, you could get $10,000 easily, and I've learned how to do these things through books, YouTube, forums and online courses. Okay, self-taught entrepreneurship. Um, I have a question from Joan. Um, digital and entrepreneur, great idea, but how do I know if the site is secure? What can, oh, what can, can I look for? So can you tell us a little bit about SSL? Yeah, for sure. So now SSL is, now I, I can't give you the, 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 the details of exactly you know, how SSL works, but one of the things that you will look for if you want to make a purchase on a website is when you are in the browser, you're going to see HTTP. You want to look for HTTPS. Yes. Once it is secure, you'll also see usually a lock on the left-hand side of the browser in the URL. Once you see that lock, that means that this site is secure with an SSL certificate that will allow for e-commerce transactions, one. The next thing you want to do that is most important is you always want to check your no like, and trust factor with any brand, right? And I'll give you an example of what that looks like. We in the Caribbean will not bat an eye to shop on Amazon. <laughs> However, your local store who <laughs> might have not the flashiest looking website, it might look like it's back in the 80s. It could be an S it could be secured with an SSL certificate, but the website looks terrible. You look at that, you're like, hmm. No. I'm not feeling this. <laughs> this this ain't look like I'll put my information on this website and I'll get the product. I trust Amazon. I don't trust this website. And a lot of times it's because it doesn't look up to snuff. So 
Look at the website. Google, Google the company. Look to see if there's reviews on Google, right? You could also jump into Facebook. Um, see what their presence is looking like, see if they have any reviews on Facebook, because now you can't fake a review on Google or, or Facebook. You might be able to get some <laughs> friends and family to put, but yeah. believe you me, when the, when the public is out for you for your bad service, they come out for you. They will, they will leave a review on every platform. So you are seeing, and you're going to use those as, as benchmarks to see whether or not, this is a website that is good for you to, to, to do business with online. Okay, great. So I, I, I agree with you, but I, in defense of our citizens, I think mm -hmm. that is about to change. I think COVID Agreed. has brought a lot of people who would not have considered Agreed. online shopping locally. Agreed. Um, even several supermarket change, um, chains, I'm not talking about the bigger ones, but they're very small mom and pop shop have been doing their businesses online quietly for years and years. Agreed. And now COVID has helped the world get around about those One, businesses. 100% agreed. We're going to be more comfortable doing it. Um, you know, just make sure now that we're more comfortable, just, just again, Always look for reviews. Like if you aren't sure about if this specific business is one to shop with online, just look for reviews. You'll always see whether the, you know, the business is doing good, whether the business is doing bad, and make your decision from there. I'm so sorry we're out of time, but can you, words of advice for anyone thinking, for the young person, the middle-aged person, thinking about going online, um, stories you've learned along the way? Yeah. We no longer have an excuse. The information is coming out slowly but surely. And even if you can't find information on your banks, you could definitely come on to KarenRose.com because I'm always initiating those conversations and talking about it. We don't have an excuse because we have to start doing e-commerce and getting online. But then the tools that we need do not cost an arm and a leg. You can, so when I started, I had next to no money. And when I mean no money, I mean no money to start my online store. And when I learned how to build a WordPress website, it cost me time because I had to learn it. But ultimately, when I figured out, wait a minute, hosting was only $5 US a month. Then when I got WePay, WePay doesn't have a monthly fee they charge per transaction. So as long as if once a sale comes in, I make money, we pay makes money, right? And then actually building my website costed me less than 500 TT to build both of my websites. I have spent less than 500 TT to build both of my websites and they are both e-commerce ready platforms. So money's not an excuse. The tools to get paid internationally is not an excuse. We have it. We have everything we need to get started now. The question I leave everybody with is, do you actually want to get started? Because now you don't have the excuses. A couple of years ago, we did. But now you literally have no excuse. It might not be perfect when you start, but get started and do what you can until you can do better. Okay, great. So I have a comment from Angela Murray, who is saying the lack of information and this I am reading this to tie in what you've been saying. Mm -hmm. It's no excuse. So the lack of information is key for TNT. And another problem is the amount of red tape required to get information about contracts to attempt to do business in Trinidad and Tobago. There's a need for universities and educational systems, and I think people like Canto and different platforms to take responsibility to change the direction of one education and retooling content in schools and re-education. And um, what I want to say and what I want to highlight to the audience is that we've had you tell your story and give us some information. And you created your part where there was none. And my goal is to see more people like you, more youths take that jump and um, 
use people like Canto as a platform to get your word out there. So this was certainly a very good conversation for myself and I guess the audience. Um, thank you so much, Karen. I have Thanks, some, Robert. yeah, I have some, some ending comments, which is to the audience, remember that the next webinar will be on Tuesday, the 2nd of July at 11 a.m. Join the conversation when we focus on St. Kitts and Nevis. Our guest will be Dion M. Taj, General Manager of Digital St. Kitts and Nevis, and she will share her perspective and insights on leading her company through the crisis and the future of telcos post-COVID. Thank you. Remember, as Karen said, we can now work from anywhere. Stay safe. Stay connected with Canto Conversations. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, audience.